Welcome to First Baptist Church. Before I read uh, this passage of scripture, I just want to say thank you to all the ladies in the room today. Uh, we know that today is a, we do call it Mother's Day, but I just want to extend a, just to say thank you to all the ladies in the room. Um, it's a, it's a, I, I believe that my uncle used to say, he says, behind every great man is a, a lady that's helped that man make good decisions. So I want to say congratulations to ladies for helping us men make good decisions in life. So welcome to church today. The value of wisdom in Proverbs, as I was reading this earlier this week, I thought I would share this. Chapter 2, first four or five verses say this. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Today, I pray that as we listen to the music and we listen to the pastor's message, that we will seek out wisdom and that we will use wisdom to make our decisions. Wisdom that God gives us to make the best decisions possible, ultimately, we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us, which is what he has called us to do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you again for this beautiful day. The sun is shining. The temperature is just amazing. And we just say thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Father, I just pray that you will, you will prick our hearts today with between the music and the message, Lord, that ultimately we will walk out and we will gain wisdom as we read in the scripture. But we will gain the wisdom from what we hear today and then we will go out and be bold witnesses, bold in our sharing, bold in our stance, Lord, and bold and strong in who we are that people can see that we are unwavering in our faith to you and to your son, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we will listen to what you have to say and that we'll make good decisions and good choices. Again, Father, we say thank you for this day, and in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If you'll stand with Worship the King.
Please take a few moments and bow your heads and spend some time with the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come before you this morning and as we open our hearts and for examination through you, Lord, I pray that you will speak to us as we look to see where we have failed you and where we need to reconcile with you. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to focus on that reconciliation, and bring your hearts back in a true union with you. Lord, as, as, sin, is pointing out, as sin is pointed out in our life, I pray that, uh, that we suddenly can stop doing and, and turn the page and go to the direction that you want us to go. Father, I know that in this world, Satan is asking us to go down roads that are not good. He wants us to go down paths that are not paths you want us to be on. Ultimately, Lord, you have an ultimate will for us, and I pray that we will be following your will. Your will be done. Father, in our world today, we have war, we have hurt, we have pain, we have sorrow. And I pray, Lord, for those folks that are fighting those battles, Lord. I pray for the battles that are truly war, but I pray also for the battles uh, that are just out there with just pure sin and evil going on. I pray for those folks that are under persecution. Father, today, I pray that our focus is what you truly want for our lives, and that we follow that. We love you, we thank you, and I thank you for each and every person that's gathered here today. I pray that you will bless them through the music and the message, and I pray that you will give them a blessing. We love you, and we thank you. If you're able to stand, stand with us again as we continue worship.
This morning's scripture reading is from Colossians 3, 18 through ver- chapter 4, verse 1. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husband, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are clear, your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with the seniority of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that you are from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, musicians, for pointing us to Christ this morning. Let's look to the Lord for his help today. Father, we pray that you would open up our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your law. We know that you have breathed out this word that we might receive it this morning with gratitude for your love for us shown in your revelation of yourself and your will for us through your word. So I pray that we would be willing, humble, and obedient to receive that word and to respond to it with faith and obedience this morning. Thank you for the privilege and opportunity to be able to open up your word to these folks, and I pray that you would bless this time. May your word not return void, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy Mother's Day. I am so grateful for the legacy of faithful mothers that we have in our church. Moms give and give and give and rarely receive the recognition for their giving spirit. Mother's Day should probably be a day of the week instead of a yearly holiday because we don't take enough time appreciating the work of moms. And yet, even as I say that, I recognize that Mother's Day is an extremely difficult holiday for many, perhaps even some who are here today. You may desire to have children. For whatever reason, that hasn't been in God's plan for you at this point. You may have lost your mom or your wife. You might struggle on Mother's Day because your mom was abusive or difficult. Maybe you feel guilty because you weren't a very good mom. And I want to acknowledge that Mother's Day isn't always full of of great feelings for everybody. And if that's you, I pray that God will give you grace as you're dealing with that today. But even as we honor moms today, the passage of Scripture that we're looking at is, I believe, appropriate and applicable to all of us here. On Easter Sunday, we looked at the beginning of Colossians chapter 3. And Paul showed us that since we've been spiritually risen with Christ, that changes everything about our lives. The resurrection affects everything about us. The gospel changes everything about us. We saw a few weeks back how it causes us to be killing the sins that used to dominate us before we were saved. And we saw last week how the resurrection causes us to put on new clothes, the virtues and the priorities of Jesus Christ. Well, this week, on a day when we think about our human relationships Paul shows us how the gospel revolutionizes our relationships. 
See, Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1, shows us how the resurrection of Jesus and our own spiritual resurrection with Him changes our closest relationships in life. So if you have your Bibles, or if you have your Scripture journals, please turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1, where we're going to see our new resurrected relationships. How does the gospel and how does the resurrection revolutionize our closest relationships? There are three different sets of relationships that Paul addresses in these verses. Wives and husbands in verses 18 and 19. Children and parents in verses 20 and 21, and then employees and employers starting with verse 22. So let's look at the first set of relationships, wives and husbands, in verses 18 and 19. Paul writes this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Now, folks, it's important that Paul addresses these relationships because, if you think about it, he's already emphasized how all of us are one in Christ. There's nobody who's more of a Christian or less of a Christian based on common earthly distinctions. Men aren't more saved because they're men, and women aren't closer to God because they're women. No, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses all who place their faith in Jesus alone to save them. There isn't a difference in value or worth between men and women. We've all received the same indwelling Holy Spirit who's helping us to become more like Jesus every single day. But Paul is careful to show us that the resurrection doesn't completely obliterate human distinctions either. It's not as though there's no difference between men and women. But the gospel revolutionizes these relationships and causes believers to look different in a world that often distorts these relationships. And we'll talk about these differences as we walk through these verses. So first, Paul addresses women. Wives, submit to your husbands. Now folks, I'm not sure we could find many passages in the Bible that offend our modern world sensibilities than this one right here. But as Christians, if the Bible is our final authority, we don't get our cues from what the world thinks. We don't form our worldview based on what people think. We allow the Bible to shape our worldview. And we don't need to feel like we have to apologize for what the Bible says. And even though some have claimed that this is just a cultural command, it doesn't really apply in our enlightened society today, Paul makes it clear that this is fitting in the Lord. That means that in the realm of our resurrected Savior, this is the appropriate way that relationships should work. Now, at the same time, we need to make sure that we understand the Bible so that we don't claim our misunderstandings of the text as authoritative or stake our beliefs on our traditions and call them biblical authority. So the word translated here as submit is also translated subject yourselves. This concept of submission or subjection refers to voluntarily putting oneself under the authority and leadership of another. 
It's not an issue of value or worth. It's an issue of order and function. Paul refers to this relationship as headship in 1 Corinthians 11 and Ephesians chapter 5. In fact, Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians about the same time as he wrote this letter to the Colossians. And he talks about a lot of the same things. This is what he says in Ephesians 5, 22-24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So the comparison that Paul makes in these verses is to Christ and the church. Just as we, the church, submit ourselves to Christ, so wives should submit themselves to their husbands. Now, what exactly does that mean? What does that look like? I think it might be helpful to say first what that doesn't mean. So first, as we've already mentioned, submission does not imply or mean inferiority. Men and women, husbands and wives, are equal in worth before God. Also, it doesn't mean that women or wives are to submit to any man or husband. This is a submission to your husband, the man with whom you have a close, personal, vital relationship. Third, submission isn't absolute. Remember, submission is about order. Wives voluntarily submit themselves under the headship of their husbands, but there's an even higher authority than the husband, and that's God. See, whenever men encourage their wives to do something that violates God's commands, wives have a responsibility to obey God rather than listen to their husbands in that matter. And fourth, submission doesn't mean that wives are to subject themselves to abuse or violence, whether physical, emotional, or any other kind. In the past, this passage has been used to guilt women into remaining in abusive situations. But that's not what biblical submission involves. Well, how do we know that? Look at Paul's next words. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. See, a wife's Biblical submission to her husband is commanded in tandem with his Christ-like love for her. Just as Christ loved the church and sacrificed himself on a cross for her, so husbands are called to love their wives with a self-sacrificial love that's always asking how he should be giving of himself to meet her needs and to help her to become more like Christ. The leadership of a home that God delegates to husbands is not to be oppressive or self-serving, but instead loving and self-sacrificing. Ever since the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden, men have had a sinful tendency to be harsh and abusive in their leadership roles. And that has most certainly contributed to women's sinful tendencies to chafe under and undermine their husband's leadership. But Paul reminds us here that our spiritual resurrection revolutionizes these relationships. Husbands work to be like Christ and sacrificially love their wives as their wives work to joyfully submit to that loving leadership. That's the order that reflects Christ to the world and brings glory to Him. Now there's lots of complexities that you could add to the equation that might raise a host of questions about how this works. 
What if the wife is in a role of leadership in her workplace and used to giving orders and the husband is in a more submissive role at work? How can they practice biblical roles at home? Or what if the husband isn't a believer and therefore doesn't see the need to practice self-sacrificial loving leadership? Should the wife still practice biblical submission? Or what if both the husband and the wife are saved, but the wife doesn't agree with the husband's decisions most of the time? Is it really realistic that she can submit to him? Unfortunately, we can't get into all of the variables today. But it's absolutely important that we don't try to make exceptions to biblical commands where the Bible doesn't give those exceptions. Clearly, the Bible doesn't encourage abuse or that wives submit to abuse. But that doesn't mean that wives shouldn't submit themselves to husbands who aren't believers. In fact, Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 3. You can look at that later if you want. And he says that some wives may even win their husbands to the Lord through their respectful attitudes and submissive actions. Each spouse should do their best to fulfill their part of the biblical relationship, even when the other spouse doesn't seem to be trying. In other words, husbands, you can't say, well, she doesn't submit to me, so I don't need to love her. No, you fulfill your biblical responsibility to love her sacrificially and lead her to be more like Christ. Let the Holy Spirit work to convict her of her need to fulfill her responsibility of biblical submission. And men, if your wives have wisdom in areas that you don't, or they're more gifted in areas that you aren't, you can show wisdom and love by deferring to her when making decisions in those areas. This passage isn't saying that men need to make all decisions in the home. It's emphasizing that men will be held accountable by God for the decisions that are made in the home. So they should exercise wisdom by recognizing where they have weaknesses and taking advantage of all the resources that God has provided, including the wisdom of their wives. And wives will be held accountable by God for how they support and submit to their husbands. The resurrection revolutionizes marriage relationships to point others to the love of Jesus Christ. But folks, wives and husbands aren't the only relationship addressed in this passage. Paul follows up this discussion by talking about the relationship between children and parents. So let's read verses 20 and 21. Children... Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. You know, when Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians, he expected that they would read it aloud to the entire church, including the children. We see that even by what Paul says next when he addresses the children directly. And so kids, I want to remind you that God cares about you just as he cares about your parents. He cares about you enough to tell you how to live as believers in Jesus. And one of the main ways that you can show your friends and show others that you've been saved is by obeying your parents. Your obedience to your mom and dad pleases God. God gave you your parents. 
And so when you obey them, you're also obeying God at the same time. And if you don't have a mom or a dad, you can obey your guardians. God gives guardians to serve in the role of moms and dads. And even when your friends sometimes say bad things about their parents or don't obey their parents, you show them that you love God by obeying your parents and speaking well of your parents. God is honored when you do that. And when Paul addresses children, he's talking about anybody who's still under the care and protection of their parents. If you still live under your parents' roof and they still cover most of your expenses, then you're still responsible to obey them. And when you move out of the house and you're living independent of your parents' care and protection, you may not need to obey them anymore, but you can still honor them. You can please God and show that you're different from the unsaved world by honoring your parents when you're on your own. Now, in connection with his command to children, Paul also speaks to parents. He says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, the word translated fathers here can also be translated parents. And it's actually translated that way in several English Bible versions, maybe the one that you're reading out of this morning. By the context, that makes sense, since Paul just said for children to obey their parents, and so now he would naturally address the parents. Though it certainly could also be that Paul is addressing parents with an extra emphasis on the fathers since instructing and discipling their children is ultimately the responsibility of fathers. Either way, the command is for parents not to provoke their children so that they don't become discouraged. You know, as I was studying this verse this week, I know I was feeling the weight of of this command. Even when we're trying to be godly parents, it can be easy to become overbearing or hypercritical of our kids when they don't measure up to our standards of obedience. We want what's best for them, but sometimes we crush them under the load of our demands of them. And under that weight, they collapse, discouraged that they won't ever meet our approval. It's important to show the same grace to our kids that Jesus shows to us. We certainly never could measure up to God's perfect standard of righteousness, and that's why Jesus had to do it in our place. It's good to show that to our children regularly so that they're as familiar with the gospel as they are with the law. We can exasperate our children by being overprotective, by showing favoritism, by setting unrealistic goals, by failing to show affection, by failing to provide for their needs. We can provoke them through criticism or neglect or excessive discipline. It can often be difficult to strike a balance in parenting, but our relationships at home glorify God when children do their best to obey their parents and parents do their best to lead their children without discouraging them. May God help us to love and disciple our children as God does us. So we've looked at the relationship between wives and husbands and the relationship between children and parents. Folks, there's one more relationship that Paul addresses in these verses. Let's read starting with verse 22. 
Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Folks, there are some who have criticized Paul here because he doesn't explicitly condemn slavery. And they think that Paul's addressing the slaves and masters condones the practice of slavery and makes it look like God approves of slavery. But nowhere does Paul condone the institution of slavery here or anywhere. The purpose of this passage is to show how the resurrection affects people in whatever situation they're in. The gospel speaks into whatever state of life you find yourself in. Whether you're a master or a slave, a parent or a child, a husband or a wife. No one can point to their situation and say that they can't obey God and be transformed by the gospel. Even those in an ungodly system can behave in a godly manner. Now, praise God, in our society, we don't experience the institution of slavery. But just about all of us find ourselves in the position of being an employee or an employer. Most of us either report to somebody or we're responsible for other people in our jobs. And the gospel speaks into our situation as well. Because the principles that Paul teaches here affect employees and employers just as they did slaves and masters in Paul's day. So let's consider how the gospel revolutionizes our work relationships. First of all, folks, employees should work sincerely at all times since God is always present. We all know people who work really hard when the boss is around. But then they slow down immediately when the boss is out of sight. That's what Paul's talking about in verse 22. They're obeying with eye service as people pleasers. But that's not the kind of example that Christians should set. We're called to obey with sincerity of heart. That's a concentration of your will that produces a consistent product. Christians should be known as the hardest workers in any business because we know that God is always watching and we represent Him by our work ethic. God is a hard worker and we should be too. Also, employees should work hard at all times to please God rather than men. Now, I'm going to guess that in this room, we have some people who work for some tough bosses. Maybe those bosses have inconsistent standards. Maybe their mood changes a lot. They seem fine one moment and then... They fly off the handle the next. Maybe they have a foul mouth. Maybe they're just extremely demanding. In any of these scenarios, it can make work life less enjoyable and sometimes incredibly unpleasant. But Christians need to remember that ultimately, you don't just work for that boss. You don't just work for that company. You work 
for God. And when you work, it may be hard to stay motivated to please your earthly boss. But Paul reminds us in verse 23 to focus on pleasing our heavenly master. He is pleased by our hard work. We represent him well when we work hard. So work to please God rather than men. Third, employees should work remembering their eternal inheritance as God's servants. Now, I imagine when Paul said this, it was incredibly encouraging to the slaves in Colossae. Remember, folks, slaves would never expect to receive inheritances. And yet, because they've been spiritually raised from the dead, they're going to receive the same inheritance from God right alongside their earthly masters who are part of the same church. What a stunning privilege that would have been. What a revolutionary relationship change. You may never receive any kind of substantial inheritance in this world. But if you're in Christ, you're his heir. And one day you'll receive the massive inheritance of ruling and reigning with Christ forever in heaven. Now, unfortunately, those who live and die apart from Christ will receive their payment in the life to come as well. And that payment is death. The scriptures say, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no favoritism with God All who die apart from Christ earn everlasting death, but those who die in Christ will receive everlasting life. And if you're in Christ and you're an employee, you can work hard every day because you point others to Christ in the process. Now, Paul's final instruction here is to employers or bosses. It says they should treat their employees with justice and fairness since they also have a master in heaven. Now sometimes authority and power can make people think that they are above judgment. But Paul reminds us here that every person ultimately has a master in heaven. And just as we want to be treated justly and fairly, so we should treat others justly and fairly. Christian bosses should do their best to provide generous wages, fair standards, and a pleasant working environment. That's what we would want. So that's what we should do our best to offer. And if you're a Christian employee, you should represent Christ well in your business and be known as a hard worker, regardless of who your earthly boss is. And if you're a Christian employer or boss, You should be fair and generous to your employees because that also reflects well on Christ, your master in heaven. You know, folks, the gospel transforms our relationships. Our spiritual resurrection revolutionizes our relationships. But maybe you're in here today and you've never responded with faith to the message of the gospel. Maybe you're not yet a Christian. You see, today, you can bow your head in prayer. You can admit to God that you're a sinner and then receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. He stands ready to receive you today. Will you 
surrender to him today. In a moment here, I'm going to stand down front here. If you have questions about what it means to be a Christian, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Or afterwards, I'm going to be standing in the back there if you want to talk to me there or later on sometime this week. I'd love to be able to share with you how you can know that you have your sins forgiven by Jesus. But if you're a believer in Jesus, then do your closest relationships reflect that? Does the way that you relate to your spouse or your children or your parents or your bosses or your employees show them that you've been transformed by the gospel? If not, maybe now's a good time for you to pray and ask God's help that you might relate to others as somebody who's been spiritually raised from the dead. Why not take some time now to ask God to help you live out the reality of who you already are in Christ? Let's pray together. Father, we trust that as we have looked at your word this morning that you wanted to speak to us with these words. Father, we pray that even as I have preached this message, any words that were just merely mine, I wipe those from our memories. But even as I have faithfully preached words from you in your word today, I pray that those words would continue with us, that your Holy Spirit, who lives within all who believe, would continue to use those words to show us our need to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Father, you know us better than anybody knows us. You know us better than we know ourselves. So I pray that this morning you would use your word to accomplish what you want to do in our lives. And may you receive the glory for how you work through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing. Just as morning. I see many uh, faces that aren't here regularly, and we thank you for being with us as well. Maybe you're honoring mom this morning, and of course we say thanks for being here, and thanks for honoring your mom. And thank you moms uh, for all that you do for us and for our church. Thank you ladies for how you often, as uh, Pastor John said uh, this morning, 
earlier often point us in the right direction uh, when we tend to get off track as well. As we close our gathering together this morning, I'm going to close us with a word of prayer. Uh, Marilyn Nelson has asked us to uh, pray for her family and just as the different issues that they're going through together that we would uh, lift them up in prayer. And so let's bow our heads and our hearts together as we close. Father, we thank you for your grace this morning, which is evident through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who willingly and humbly took on human flesh, came to earth to die on a cross in our place, that he might absorb your wrath in our place, so that those who place their faith in him alone would never have to face the everlasting punishment that we all deserve. Father, we're grateful this morning that we can celebrate that each and every time we gather as a church family. I pray that if there's anybody in our midst who has yet to cry out to Jesus Christ to save them, that today they would recognize their need for him, that the gospel would make sense and they'd realize their place in the gospel story and receive Jesus as Savior. Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word this morning, that we might go from this place edified, built up, perhaps rebuked in some areas, but determined to work in the power of the Spirit to be changed. Father, we lift up to you Marilyn Nelson and her family. We just ask that you would give grace to them in their situation in life. Whatever issues they may face, that you would be with them and share not only your comfort, but your leadership in their lives. Undoubtedly, there are many in this room who today have heavy issues on their hearts and minds. Perhaps I don't know about, but Father, we thank you that you know all things. And I pray that you give to them grace and encouragement. Allow them to receive encouragement from your word today to remember that you never leave us nor forsake us. That your spirit goes with us to remind us of the things that you said that we might go from this place rejoicing in your word and what you're doing in our lives through the Spirit working through it. May you receive the glory through First Baptist Church this week in this community and wherever you take us for your glory. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you play, please be seated for announcements. Happy Mother's Day, First Baptist. Let's talk about what's going on at our church. Remember, Adventure Club and Student Ministries finished last week, so there are no evening ministries tonight. Now, this Thursday, the monthly Golden Airs meal will be at noon. And if you're looking for some good books to read this summer, we have some new titles that we've added to our library in the past month. Feel free to check them out as you leave today. Now, a lot of Christians don't share the gospel with others because they've never been taught how to share their faith. We're planning on hosting a one-day Share Your Faith seminar led by an Evangelism Explosion teacher on Saturday, May 21st at 9 a.m. The total cost for the seminar will be $15 per person and will include all the materials as well as lunch. The seminar will run from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and this is the last week to sign up. So if you're interested in participating, there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. Now, for years, our church has supported the Baptist Children's Home and Family Services. They provide a variety of Christian services for families, including counseling, adoption, and maternity care. And if you would like to give, you can do so online or write a check to the church and designate it for Baptist Children's Home. Finally, if you're new here at First Baptist, we'd love to get to know you. If you would please fill out one of the connection cards located in the pew rack and then drop it off at the Welcome Center in the lobby, we have a gift for you as our way of saying thanks for worshiping with us. Have a great week, First Baptist.